body and the images and then that the models that's how I understand, yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll introduce you after the chat, I forgot. Yeah, yeah. So, so because for Africa, Africa, she's like the end of She's one of the people who was driving a lot of the, the early days of the AI development. Yeah. Yeah. I'm spending like we're all a lot of the Masakali people are all going to be engineers. Then it seems sweet to plan for the next five to ten years of African life. Uh, life. For five days in one place. Good morning. Good morning. I expected it difficult to get people up tomorrow after tonight's party, but it seems already people <laughs> have been enjoying themselves. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid one bit of our transport is a little bit late, so we will have people joining us, but I think we must get started. Uh, we have two excellent um, keynote speakers. They've asked me not to introduce them, but I'll, uh, they will introduce themselves. But I will just make some housekeeping announcements. Um, there is a session tomorrow, an open session, where if you have a service, a tool, a technique for investigative journalists that you wish to showcase, there is a session where you can get five minutes or so, depending on how many um, um, uh, people want it. I think it's at 1.40 on Wednesday. Um, if you have something you would like to showcase, please talk to Isaac over there. Um, please do so. There is another session tomorrow to showcase books. If you have written a book relevant to investigative journalism, broadly relevant, then it would be great if you came, showed and talked about your book. Again, timing will depend on how many people are there and there's only there's only two or three at the moment, but I know there's a lot more books in this room. So it would be great if you came forward, and if you want to sell your book, as you've seen, you can talk to the bookseller and, um, and uh, hopefully sell some books. Okay, this evening, um, after the Carlos Cardoso lecture, there will be buses to take us to Arena, which is close by, um, um, but, but, not, but, uh, but you need transport to get there. Uh, Arena Publishers Venue is where we're going for this evening's event. Um, um, buses are leaving 15 minutes after the end of that lecture. I'm afraid we've got a very full evening. So please, after the Carlos Cardoso Memorial Lecture, please make your way to the buses as quickly as possible. If you're taking your own car, that's fine. There's parking at Arena. It is in Parktown, um, um, and we'll see you there. Um, or if you take an Uber or however you want, you want to do it, if you want to stop by your hotel or something, um, um, take an Uber, we'll see you there. Um, but we will be starting promptly there because we've got to get through the formalities so that we can get to party tonight. Um, I think that's all my announcements. Anything further? Good. Thank you very much. Over to our speakers. Okay. Uh, I guess about to start. All right. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, coming back for another AI uh, JC. We good? Oh. No screen. Okay.
Okay, I'll restart. Yeah, I'll be close. <laughs> okay, um, it's just ha having to handle this on the side. Uh, I'm Fukushima Marivati. I'm the chair of data science at the University of Pretoria, and I'll be doing this keynote uh, with Atandi Wesaba, who's a great colleague, and we've been working together uh, for a number of years, who's at Code for Africa, and actually also at the University of Pretoria with us for uh, one of our projects. Uh, just to Actually, let's, let me do this very quickly. Um, the TLDR, given everything else that's going on, unfortunately, on the west coast of the US at this current moment, uh, which sometimes might feel it overshadows what's going on in the rest of the world, which we really should be uh, uh, thinking about, is uh, we are never going back to an AI winter. We used to have these things of going between summer, I mean, having an AI summer, AI, everybody's talking about it. It's really putting in a lot of, a lot of funding is going towards that, and then going to the autumn, and then going to a winter where money gets pulled out. Uh, that's, we're not going back to that situation, and one of the biggest reasons just because uh, the top organized companies in the world at the moment are very much AI driven. Right, so we might just keep on going from summer to spring, summer to spring, summer to spring. So the hope of this talk is just to get to a point where understanding where we are, likely what the next steps are, and how a journal in journalism it actually can deal with these summers going on. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I have to speak slow. It's okay. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Simply. No more, no more winters, <laughs> no more winters. So, so that's an important thing. Um, so yeah, I've uh, gone a couple of number of places, started here actually at VETS, uh, doing my undergrad in engineering um, before this day, when this stadium was actually a stadium, and it, now <laughs> it changed into this facility. And I'm at University of Pretoria now. I'm also a co-founder and now business development for Lilaba AI, which is an AI startup based here in Rosebank. And work also on grassroots AI organizations like the Deep Learning in Daba, uh, Masakani. And at the university, we specifically work on AI and language um, on there. So we've got a number of uh, staff members, students, team members who work on lots of AI having to do with African languages. Um, and this is a very important uh, thing uh, for us. So, like, you know, we can assume that everybody really knows what AI is outside the buzzword or the little tools that people play around with, but I think it's very important for us to set a common uh, ground. So let's actually talk about AI and machine learning before we talk about large language models. So what is machine learning? Uh, this is a simplified example, but really gets you to understand uh, the intuition. So it's a subset of artificial intelligence, right? Uh, that deals with machines learning patterns from data. So let's say I give you an example here. I give you two dots, uh, one being red and the other one being blue on a plane. It's just on a flat surface. And then I ask you, can you predict if a dot that is colorless drops onto that plane what color it's supposed to be? So what you do is that you have to learn a small system, and then this system will just tell you that. And the simplest thing to learn is a straight line that sits in between the two data points. Anything that falls on the left in the future, I will just predict that it's red. Anything that falls on the right of that line, I'll predict that it's blue, right, without having a color. And, and this is basically a, what we call a decision boundary. We do know that life is not that simple. It will be more complicated. And your data tends to look a little bit more complicated. And what tends to happen is that to now fit this new data, you need a new decision boundary that's more complicated, right? Instead of the simple y is equals to mx plus c, you now have something that looks like a quadratic function in math uh, to fit that data. Now in the future, anything that is above that line, I will predict that it's blue. Anything that is below, I'll predict that it's red. And so I know it's oversimplified, but that's, I'm just trying to get you the intuition of there must be input. I must learn some pattern from that input. And then I must then be, when I get new data, I then predict given what I've learned from the past. You can then take the step, which is a huge leap, but it's okay, to where we are currently now, that for a lot of you, you have a phone, you take pictures of the phone, later on you search for the word tree, and then it shows you all the pictures of trees on your phone. What has happened? We've had models that are built taking millions and millions of pictures that are already annotated or they've tagged them with what's in the picture, and they can then identify items on, on the, in the same way that you've given them all these examples, 
the machine learns that pattern and then it can predict in the future. What so, so you can see that that's a useful uh, kind of space. And why do we do this? Be without machine learning, a programmer would have to sit there, describe in, in that picture of the cat or the dog, describe in code what a dog looks like, <laughs> what a cat looks like. It has an ear. Here's how an ear would look like. Here's how it would shape pixels, all those things. With machine learning, you would just give it lots and lots of pictures of cats, lots and lots of pictures of dogs, and then it learn, the machine learns that instead of the coder having to describe that on there. And this has been a major, major change in, in some ways uh, because what has been, when I've thought of that we've gone between the summers and the winters, is there was something that was missing there in pushing us forward. And a lot of it has been the intersection of compute, so how powerful computers are, and data, how much data you actually have. And really, for, for many people, they believe actually the data is the biggest challenge, right? The compute has caught up, and now the data is the biggest challenge. So the reason we're going through a generative AI revolution right now, this thing of things that generate images or generate text, is that now the data part is starting to also stream and, 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 and be used on there. But we should learn from this past that we've gone through these winters as well on there. So the old things will come new, become uh, new again, and we need to then uh, uh, reason about them. So now onto my next part here is then thinking about these large language models. So ChatGPT is just one example of a large language model, but there's many, many of these uh, kind of things. So remember we said we have to do this prediction, an input and an output. And I said we're going to hand wave a lot of things just so that we can understand. So one of the things you have to build in the language model is you have to build a machine learning tool that can take as input a sentence, you remove a word from that sentence, and instead of putting it as an input, you put it at the outside as an output. So you now teach the machine to basically fill in the missing word. What is this in layman's term? Autocomplete. <laughs> You've been using it on your phone, on your email for a long time. Those things are enabled by language models. Right, that you can just start typing, and then it predicts what the word that's supposed to be next is supposed to be on there. But now what we've been able to do is build bigger and bigger of these models, and in some ways they're auto, like, you know, they, they, they use this thing where all you need to do is take like Wikipedia, take lots and lots of sentences, randomly remove words, and then train the model to just keep on predicting the word that's been removed. Right? And by doing that, you've got this large language model that encapsulates some parts of the regularity of some language, right? And then once you've got that and you've trained this in English, in Setswana, in French or whatever, you can take that and then fine tune it, we'll talk about, about for a final application. So not just predicting the next word. So uh, this is where the thing of pre-training comes in. I don't know. Oh, I did not touch anything. Uh, pre-training comes in because to train these models, you can just take what comes from the internet, what some companies are doing, are scraping all of the internet, training these models first, and then from there fine tune it on a final task. So one could be spam detection, uh, and then being able to identify that spam. But the thing that's interesting for us, and how we get to things that look like ChatGPT or BARD or whatever, is this question answering. So after you've trained it to predict the next word thing, it's encapsulated some knowledge in there, the next one to give it is give it lots and lots of examples of questions and answers. So for example, here from Stanford, there's this question answering data set where it's just questions and answers, and then now you, train the, you continue training the model to be able to take in as input a question and then try to generate the answer. And by doing that, it should learn a way of saying, even if a question I haven't seen before comes in, I kind of have, can look at almost like my knowledge base and find a way to string along something that looks like an answer. Right, so that's a squad. I think squad is like 100,000 questions. Um, there's trivia QA with lots of trivia uh, for the University of Washington. Um, and then here's another one that's more near recent, that's alpaca. But many, many, many more of these things are being created right now. So now you can do question answering, right? So we're keeping to the same thing, input, output. On there, now we have to deal with the issue of, I'm going to do question and answering, but the answers might not be correct in the way that I like. And some of the ways that, for example, I, uh, my understanding, especially with journalism, is understanding either biases or stance or how somebody writes something or the, the, the sentiment or whatever. And there's also safety, that you don't want to get things that are generated that actually might be harmful. 
So the big thing that happened last year, and, and what we've done now is probably went from the 90s of AI to the 2000s of AI to the 2017, that's where the BERT paper, so the thing of doing this, uh, uh, predicting the next word in a scale became in. And now we're last year around June. So last year around June, uh, this Instruct GPT paper comes out and it says you can deal with some of these things or trying to align the values of the humans with the machine. So getting the machine to align with the humans. So what you do now is that you do question answering, but now there's a human evaluator who sees the response of the machine and then gives it another good or bad job. That this is just the, the, the next intuition here. And if you do this enough, you then align it to whoever has been asked to be the one who does this, uh, uh, this filtering, right? It creates more questions, right? If you remember the early days of ChatGPT in November, December last year, there was a lot of uh, uh, papers written about how ChatGPT is at a very right-leaning or very left-leaning, right? Because you do have this instruction <laughs> Uh, 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 a part that happens where a human has to sit there and then OpenAI had to be doing this thing of saying, okay, we, we're releasing another update where now you do have to ask yourself, how is it that we're giving one company <laughs> the power to choose where we stand, right, with kind of thing, but that's what's going on. There's a lot of now this instructional alignment work that happens to then align these systems to hopefully mimic the way a human would but then the bias that we have as humans is the same bias that the machines will have. Like, so, so there's this part of saying machines don't have bias. That's untrue. The data that we create is going to be biased. The people who are going to sit and make choices about the alignment are going to be biased. And this will actually creep in uh, on here. And it's very important at this point to know that it wasn't just ChatGPT. I showed you Instruct GPT, which was like in, in, uh, GPT 3.5 that came out before um, uh, uh, ChatGPT came out in November, and there were many, many more of these models before, and there have been many, many more models after. And they come from lots of different organizations. The thing that happened with ChatGPT is just that it became a customer-facing or a, a consumer-facing technology as opposed to it's only for the developers who are building things in the background. And now it's out there. People are trying to use it for many, many, many different uh, kind of things on there. So, so there I'm just showing lots of different models, their, their sizes. Palm is like from Google, OPT uh, from, from um, and NLLB come from Meta or Facebook. Uh, I think there's Jurassic and, and NLG for Microsoft. So all of these are different companies that had been working on this um, um, on there. And there's a whole like, uh, uh, you know, almost like a family tree of where we go around 2017 and where we are right now, we're on the top right, where GPT-4s, all those things. And you can see how many, many more of these, and a lot of them are invisible to you. You've just been using them, whether you're in Gmail and doing autocomplete, <laughs> right, where you're on other app and then it's doing stuff. They've been using these uh, kind of models um, inside them. Uh, to finish off in the last minute for this section before Tandiwe comes on, is then to understand this thing. I've said we take the, we take, we scrape the internet, we train this model, but this model is actually smaller than the internet in size. So what happens is that you need to do compression. You take all of the content that is out there, you have to compress it into this model. It's still big, let's say multi uh, terabytes and petabytes, but it's still not the size of the internet. And the intuition here to have, was a very nice article here from the New Yorker, is that it's a blurry JPEG. You remember, if you took an image and you had to reduce the size, it would become blurry. That's what's happening. There's loss that is happening. And that's why when it comes to some things, you can ask uh, these systems questions, and then they come back with very weird answers, or they miss facts, or they can't reason correctly. Part of that is because of this compression that is going on. Right? Um, I'm not going to show an example, but in the past, you could ask the ChatGPT, what weighs more, um, what is it, one kg of bricks or two kgs of feathers? This would be simple, they weigh the same. Uh, I mean, sorry, this would be simple that they won't weigh the same because you've said one and two. But then because online, there's this reoccurring logical game of one kg of feathers and one kg of bricks, it will keep on saying they actually weigh the same because it ignores the numbers. Right? They've changed it now. It's, it's, it's fixed. But these are some of the issues that were coming in here. And it made sense if you start thinking about this issue of compression that is going on inside these models. The other one is how it deals with our languages. 
So this is some work uh, at, at our a startup called Lilapa on just looking and saying feed ChatGPT count from one to ten in Isizulu, and then it would say Gu one, Gu two, Gu three, Gu four, Gu five, <laughs> which is obviously not correct, right? It's adding kind of on there. Uh, here is a translation. Uh, the, 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 the sentence there, Kuyabiza Ibanoi. It's expensive to go on an airplane, but then you can see what the translation is. Uh, it says, he insults me. <laughs> I can't call him a coward. Right, so these, these parts now where there's really very, they, they don't work well because there's not that much data, and they're also not fine-tuning for these languages. They're not working to actively say, let's improve it for these languages, but then we know people are using them to do this. Right, um, uh, kind of on there, I'll skip on there. And this then comes down to who gets counted when it comes to these systems. Who are the people that they're being designed for? And as Africans, we, or like, you know, we have to then start thinking very actively about this because then we need to deal, especially with all these corners we don't see that uh, look like they're in the dark. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, guys. He's going to be back. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about investigative journalism in the space of and the age of AI and how um, LLMs kind of fit into it. Um, okay, I just need to get this cursor thing right. So I'm Atandu Asaba. I am the managing editor of iLab at Code for Africa. I work with an amazing team of forensic analysts and investigators who look into um, coordinated online behavior, misinformation, and we use a lot of these tools that are based on a lot of what Vukosi has just spoken about. Code for Africa, for those who don't know at this point, uh, we're quite uh, uh, um, a, an African kind of focused organization. We are doing some of the work that I've just spoken about in about 26 different African countries. You can see some of the partners that uh, we work with in our consortium. And we conduct, as I've mentioned, investigative forensic research and co into coordinated networks and information manipulation. We also um, have a fact-checking side that looks into a lot of disinformation, but we also do training and help newsrooms and journalists to do their work better. These are some of um, the partners that we work with, um, Global Investigative Journalism Networks, uh, the International Fact-Checking Network as well, because we do have a fact-checking side as well, uh, University of Oxford, Reuters Institute. These are just some of the organizations we work on on the different aspects of our organization. So jumping right into the role of LLMs, because I've got other stuff we want to talk about at the end, so I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as I can. Um, so the role of LLMs in the digital age is to assist us with the volume of data. And for instance, if you're looking at actual investigative journalism, um, there's so much data that is out there. This is where LLMs come into play. With data increasingly stored in extraordinary volumes, investigative journalists can use extraordinary analysis techniques to make sense of these enormous amounts of data. What some of the stuff that Vugos was talking about in terms of identifying trends, that's one, that's one aspect that LLMs can play into. And this extends beyond just simply data analysis. And I come from a data journalism background where we would use Excel uh, um, to analyze some of the data. LLMs extend far beyond that and far beyond also just simple report generating. These models can also identify patterns and trends in the data, providing journalists with quite valuable insights that can guide them and their investigations as well. For, in, for example, an LLM could analyze a large data set of social media posts to identify common themes or topics of discussion in that at that particular time. This could provide investigative journalists with a much better understanding of public sentiment and how the public understands certain information that's being shared. LLMs can also assist in predicting future trends. LLMs can be used to predict future trends based on historic data. 
this predictive cap capability can be incredibly invaluable, valuable to journalists as it can help investigators anticipate what future developments there might be. And also LLMs can assist us in automating a lot uh, uh, of the, the routine tasks that we do in our newsrooms to assist us to focus much more on the stuff that machines can't do, like talking to people. So just to, my part is to assist the journalists in thinking about the, the journalism side and, what, and how we can connect these new technologies to some of the stories that we do. We've seen a lot of big stories that have broken uh, internationally. And some of these, a lot of these stories are, have used some of these new technologies. We've seen a lot of the ICIJ investigations. We've seen Panama Papers, the Luanda leaks. We've also been able to see something quite interesting quite recently with what's been happening with the Israel-Palestine conflict, where big um, uh, um, organizations like the CNNs are actually getting these teams to fact check. A lot of that stuff is a assisted by AI. Newsrooms in the global north, particularly those involved in major investigations like the Panama Papers, have demonstrated sophisticated and powerful use of these tools that we are talking about today. They leverage advanced technologies for data analysis, investigative journalism, and a collabor collaborative reporting. These newsrooms often employ cutting-edge software and databases to sift through large amounts of information they and therefore they are able to uncover complex financial networks exposing corruption on a global scale the successful outcomes of such investigations highlight the effectiveness of these particular tools now how do we harness ai in some of in an African context, harnessing AI for groundbreaking investigations. How would we use this in our, some of our investigations? So AI technologies empower African newsrooms to conduct groundbreaking investigations by providing advanced tools for data analysis and uncovering hidden patterns and revealing critical insights. Some of the things that AI is, can assist African newsrooms, and I'm specifically focusing on African newsrooms because we have seen the financial constraints that a lot of the newsrooms had to, have had to go through in the, past couple, in the past couple of years. Cost effective research, it allows us to do that. AI driven processes, they enable cost effective research, allowing newsrooms to allocate resources efficiently and focus on in depth investigative journalism without the financial constraints. Can you imagine? The thousands of documents, for instance, the Panama Papers had or the Luanda leaks had, and you are expecting journalists to come into a room and sift through those. That would be near impossible, never mind the cost implications of that. But now these tools are allowing us to do so much more with, with the little that we have in our newsrooms. These tools also enhance information processing tools the, the tools that we can use handle vast amounts of information, facilitating quite comprehensive investigations that delve deep into complex issues, corruption, disinformation, societal issues, and challenges as well. These tools also help us in combating, um, in combating misinformation. It has the ability to discern patterns, and this helps us identify counter disinfo and help us to identify and counter disinformation, ensuring investigative reports are based on accurate and verifiable data. It also helps with the language barrier, actually, because once you're able to find something that's written, one, a, a lot of the work that we do uh, is, is, is based in the Sahel region as well, and sometimes a lot of the posts that we have to pick up are in French and in other languages as well. I'm not a French-speaking, most of my team members aren't French-speaking, but some of these tools assist us in understanding the patterns and the language and are able to classify some of this information that we find. What you're seeing currently on the screen are some of the tools that in my team, the team that I work with, the iLab team actually uses and the other, and the other newsrooms that we are able to train uh, uh, in our sessions. Connected Africa, huge database of, of information there that explores the links between politics, power, and money across Africa. You can input uh, a particular organization or a person 
person that you're looking into or a politician, multi-go, media cloud. These are just some of the tools um, uh, that we use. And to get a, li a little bit of a gist of some of these tools, you can go up there to Civic Signal. We will, share, we will share this presentation, Civic Signal, and you can actually see how we use some of these tools. So I want to go into a couple of examples just to show how um, the stories that have come up from using some of these tools. Possibly some of you guys went to some of the presentations yesterday that my team was uh, working on and they spoke about Wagner and what's happening in the Sahel region. One of the stories that we have been able to put together was a freak media TV. Is this the Kremlin's new African mouthpiece? This story is important because it show it it, it focuses on uh, external influences and what they can do in the African context if they are allowed to continue. So Wagner and, and Afric Media TV have been able to work quite closely together, and we have been be able to identify that they are engaging uh, Wagner and um, the, the former head of Wagner, Prigozhin, um, and... and, and, and um, Afric Media TV have there. There's been several uh, exclusive, as they said, exclusive uh, interviews between the two, between them. The media outlets, the uh, Afric Media TV, strategic dissemination of pro Wagner propaganda videos across various social media platforms indicates quite a deliberate effort to extend the reach of their narratives. And if you know a little bit about Afrique Media TV, they are online, they have a website, they are on different social media platforms. They have quite a vast reach. We were able to be we were able to connect the dots using some of the tools that I'd mentioned, Multigo, to show that Afrique Media is getting a lot more coverage, is getting a lot more exclusive coverage from Wagner and Prigozhin than any other uh, uh, media house across Africa. And we needed to try and figure out why that was. Because Wagner has also been implicated in, in a, a, um, a report a little while ago about being able to involving themselves in uh, certain countries' elections, and South Africa included as well. This particular influence has the, the, the potential to shape the public opinion and impact public outcomes as well in different African countries. This is a story uh, from um, Africa Uncensored. I hope some of you guys were in the conversation yesterday. Africa Uncensored talking about some of their work. This is part of a series called Indebted, which was looking at Kenya's journey to the debt crisis. This story is quite important because it sheds light on the intricate dynamics leading to Kenya's debt crisis, it, in exploring the impact of political alliances, questionable project funding and financial mismanagement. I think in a lot of countries, we've seen some of uh, uh, very similar examples. Uh, the investigation exposed the corruption, the dodgy deals, government's fiscal ineptitude, prompting quite a big public awareness and emphasizing the need for responsible governance. In working with Africa Uncensored on this particular, on this particular series, I think they were working with uh, the iLab team and they were using Connected Africa to review some of the documents that were used by, um, to review some of the documents that they had found, especially the contracts around a big dam that was uh, being uh, constructed at that time. Another example is IPOB, Diaspora, the, the particular network. Now, for those who don't know why, what IPOB is, it's the indigenous people of Africa. However, it has been designated as a terrorist organization by the Nigerian government. This organization has been noted for spreading quite vast amounts of disinformation and hate speech, especially through social media. And how are you able to track that without some of these tools? This group has quite a large uh, propaganda machine, which is spanning quite uh, vastly across the diaspora, playing a significant role in disseminating its controversial campaign. The group has been involved in attacks on civilians, security personnel, and politicians, yet earning it as the third deadliest terror organization in Nigeria uh, in a based on the 2022 Global Terrorism Index. And what we wanted to understand better is who was funding this particular group. And we found that a lot of the, of, of the, 
of the officials or members of IPOP was spread across um, uh, the world as well. And some of the funding and the head of IPOP as well was based in the UK and other people across the world. And we were able to track a lot of this information using AI tools. My last example here is another investigation that was done by the iLab team and looking at Ghana itself. Ghana and there was a particular protest just after, um, just after the, the, junta took, the junta government took over in Niger. There was a pro-Russian protest in Ghana and pro-junta as well. However, this particular protest was coordinated and assisted in the coordination of it by Samyun Buyokov. I think some of you might know him, a pro-Russian podcaster and a YouTuber who's based in Australia. And he emerged as quite a central figure in orchestrating the protest itself. His involvement goes beyond just advocating for um, marching and protesting. He went in and provided the Russian flags. He funded the production of the Wagner Group t-shirts that were worn during the march. And he actively encouraged similar protests across West Africa. He even came out to say he would uh, put up the money for anyone who was arrested or the actual organizers who, ar who were arrested during this particular march. So getting started in thinking about how we use AI and LLMs and all of this, I know as, as, as a data journalist, having spoken quite a bit about data journalism at this conference for several years, it always feels quite daunting when we have to think about all of these technical aspects. And none of us, and I figured actually when I was, when I'm working, when I was working on the data journalism side, none of us actually have to be coders. We just need to be interested and have an actual problem in our news. Room. There's so many tools that are currently out there, but what we're not thinking about is what do we need? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And is there a tool out there, is there a technology out there that can make our jobs simpler and for us to be able to go through so much data and analyze it and make sense of it? Newsrooms worldwide, especially in the global south, face long-standing challenges, as I had mentioned, financial constraints, political interference, and low literacy levels at, at some points as well. A technological gap, gap exists, making it harder for news organizations in less prosperous economies to acquire some of these resources, provide the training to some of the journalists in their newsrooms, access information and the data itself, purchase the technologies. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand over to Vugosi because at the end, what I do want to do is talk about how we all together can actually stop making strides in this AI world. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're gonna go now to the thing I'm really passionate about, and that's uh, the really the development of African languages. And one of the blocks that's very, very important is actually journalism, um, and from the perspective of telling the stories of African people in their languages, right? And there are opportunities there uh, for us who work in the AI space to learn and then also to contribute back uh, from what's going on uh, within there. So I'll, I'll go through this uh, through a couple of examples. Oh. Um, oh. Okay. Everything <laughs> through a few examples, hopefully. Uh, so uh, as I said, remember at the beginning I said there was compute and data, and I think data is more important. Uh, one of the challenges that we have as, as researchers and practitioners in this space in building these models is getting access to African language uh, content, whether it's speech, text, whatever. Uh, on, on the, so we'll talk about text. Uh, this is a project we worked on at the beginning of there with a couple of people in the uh, university lab. And we were trying to identify how, how we can create more uh, uh, content, um, sorry, more models for South African languages, but you have to get the data. One of the challenges is that the data n is sometimes hidden or behind, uh, like, you know, literal uh, walls, in, <laughs> even though they're virtual. So what we wanted to do is you want to liberate and prepare the textual multilingual data, extract sentence pairs. There's very good tools now to actually automatically align different documents that you know are having the same content, aligning sentences uh, automatically, automate as much of the process, benchmark, and then release this data. So let me talk a little bit about creating the data. 
So one, South Africa, when Parliament sits, there's a covenant statement that comes out at the end. And this covenant statement, normally within a week or two, is translated from English into the rest of the South African languages. South Africa has 12 official languages, 11 also being written, uh, and then the 12th is South African Sign Language right, um, on there. So uh, can we take all the written text and then actually automatically extract it, align it, put it, and get it ready for people to be able to click and download? Right, not necessarily having to go every page by page, but you just want people to download a CSV or a JSON file or whatever on there. For machines, this is very important to automate a lot of processes. So we did that. Uh, we have a scraper. I think it runs every Friday. Puts this together, and you can go and you can find it, and you can download all the cabinet statements, and they are completely tagged and everything like that. Um, and that data set is released. It's, it, as I said, basically every Friday, if there's a new statement, it, 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 it automatically expands. The other one is Vuguzanzele. Vuguzanzele is a South African newspaper from the government. Uh, it's released in two editions a month. Um, if there's 20 or 30 English articles, which are the main, I think, again, it's not me, I haven't, <laughs> it'll come back. Um, if there's 20 or 30 English news articles, only about two or three of them get translated to the rest of the South African languages. So that's almost like a 10% throughput. Right, then it's saying that South Africans only, like, you know, if you're not really comfortable reading or you don't even or can't read in English, you only see 10% of what is happening in terms of civic education. Right, and this is a huge issue. So we went to the government asking for access to the, instead of the PDF copy, PDF is not good for machine uh, um, processing. Um, it's great for us to see because we can typeset and all those things, but it's very bad. We tried to get access and the government office said no. They could not give us the direct translations. There's a mix of reasons that really, for me, don't pass any master. They're not really correct, but we will deal with that later. So what we did is that lab members for last year, uh, some we were able to hire, some volunteered, and worked on actually extracting, <laughs> like painfully, from their PDFs, extracting the, 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 the new stories, and then uh, tagging them, and then aligning them. Right, so then it becomes a TXT file. Every new story just becomes a TXT file that has the title of the story, who wrote it, and then the rest of the text. Uh, that becomes available, we know which edition kind of it is. And one of the things I said you could do, for example, is you can align. So now you can have, it's in Debele and Venda, 19,000 sentences that are aligned. It's the same sentence, just in this in Debele and in Chivenda. Right? And this is transformative because if the more you make these available, the better it is to train machine-driven uh, translation systems, kind of on there. And uh, that's one of the things that we did. Here we use English as a pivot language just to compare against other models, but we're currently working on, tra on building translation models for all 55 directions of South African languages. Right, because now we've got this data, we're, we're increasing it, we're making it more and more, you now are going to have these new directions of translations that weren't there before. And they're machine driven, so you can put in something in Sindabele, and then it will get translated in Shishitsonga. Right, and those are the things that we want to make sure that these tools are available to people. They might not be completely accurate. Uh, here's a piece of Seswati from the SABC Seswati News. And then if you use our model, the Seswati model is available for Seswati to English, and then it translates it there. Uh, it will have some errors, but you can get the gist of what is actually going on, right? And, and we, op we release these kind of openly on there. Now, I talked earlier that you have to build these precursors, these language models, the ones that do autocomplete kind of thing, before you start doing the other work of doing alignment or question answering. So here is a story of what we did for three years building up a Setswana language model. So this is a project that started in 2020, uh, actually just before COVID hit um, in terms of in South Africa. And what we did here, uh, which is interesting, English data for ChatGPT BARD is likely in the petabytes that is used to train these models. For Setswana, we were able, over three years of work, to gather uh, 25 megabytes <laughs> of Setswana. All right, 25 megabytes of Setswana, and you can see all the where it comes from um, on the side there. Uh, lots of different uh, places. Uh, some of it is Vuguzanzele, which we were able to create basic education, all those things. The other thing there, so that's about 4.5 million words. They're not unique, just how many words were in the thing. Then there's a data set called JW300, which was created by the Natural Language Processing Community, which is a con uh, consists of aligned content that comes from Jehovah's Witnesses. In 2021, if I remember correctly, the Jehovah's Witnesses then put out a cease and desist that people should stop 
are publishing that data set. For many, many African languages, this data set was likely the largest amount of data for that language because the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are very prolific translators. They translate a lot of their content into many, many, many languages across the world. So just in comparison, JW300 was four times as big as the amount of data we had to find on there. Because we started in 2020, we had it. And JW300 is, is 20 million tokens or words. And if you put it together, JW300 plus poor data, you get to 25 million. Right? And, but I want to show you that this, even though it's biased, now it'll be religious, it'll be whatever, but for many, many languages, this is probably one of the largest corpora that they have for their language, or for some, might be the only one. And what the, J, the, 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 the Jehovah's Witnesses organization did, and it has huge implications for language development. All right, uh, on there. So we trained the Roberta model, and we trained it, in this case, it was three days for poor Berta, just using the data we create, we got, and then th another three days for poor Berta plus JW300. And what can you do with this stuff now? One, you can change things like entity recognition. You can go through sentences and be able to identify that Setswana where there's a mention of a location, where there's a date, uh, where there's a person. If this one, the person is actually wrong. But just imagine having lots and lots of Setswana text, lots of documents, lots of news articles, and being able to now automatically go through all of them, uh, add this, all of this metadata, and then creating a new search interface for users that can then go through all this information. So you're basically taking something that will look like unstructured data and put it into a structure that is useful. You can, um, in this one, sorry, uh, yeah, our model, don't know. Uh, then this one is a part of speech, more if you're trying to extract parts of speech from the documents. And the other thing that we did, we took daily news. Daily news is the Botswana uh, news service, and they then also have a Setswana version of daily news. We took 5,000 articles from there, and what we did is then we categorized them using the IPTC uh, news codes, right? So news categorization, high-level ones, and now took every article, got some people to work and actually tag each of them. And then what you can do with that is now we can train a machine learning model that can predict the categories or, 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 or of each of the news articles in Setswana natively, right? And uh, this, we got to about 65% accuracy, and then you can see there's a piece of text in Setswana at the top, and then it tags it and tells you that it's 75% chance that it has to do with crime and law, which is true, because it has to, it's talking about, I think, people going, uh, uh, going to court over there. I know I'm, I moved away from the mic. So these are tools that now become available on here. I'll try to speed up in this last bit. Then, uh, this was just from what our lab is doing, and we're still expanding into other languages, but there's some work across the African continent, especially by Masakane and lots of other networks to build more and more tools here. One is driven through the Lacuna Fund that actually provides uh, funding for people to create uh, lots of data sets for AI on there, and we've given a lot of money towards language. Um, so one corpus in this area is what we call, oh, I see what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, the Ken corpus, which consists of uh, a speech, text, question answers, all those things for languages um, like uh, Kiswahili, uh, Luyo, all those, those are being made available for people then to try and then use. And it's enabled by community coming together and saying, let's create these resources uh, for these languages. There's Masaka News, which comes from Masakani, the Masakani or, um, organi um, research organization, which you can see how many languages, that's news content in all of those languages, and now they've gone on and tagged it and then built new machine learning models that if you have content in that language, it will automatically now categorize it uh, for you um, uh, within there, and then there's some performance um, of there. At Lilapa, uh, which I said is our startup here, we're building tools, especially for now, in speech. So if you need to be able to transcribe uh, a local language, um, um, or like in African languages, we're building tools in that area that you can upload MP3s and then get the transcript of, um, and for now, I think we're just early access for Isizulu, uh, for, for Sesotho, for Afrikaans, for South African English, but our ambition is to cover as many African languages in the next two or three years as possible within these and being state of the art. So you can sign up at the moment uh, for early access um, uh, to our tools um, at Lilaba AI on, on, on that part. So just to like, stop and then uh, <laughs> I think a 10 year old thing is look here. AI models have always been there with us. Um, there's still much to do and we need to experiment. 
Uh, it's not just something to just say we fear and then we stop from engaging, but there's opportunities there. But we need to shape it, as, 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 and especially as Africans. We need to shape what is it that we want these kind of models to really uh, have, uh, how do they match up to our values, and what do we expect as we transition? We know there's going to be a transition give, given technology, but what is it that we want? It cannot be something that happens to us. Right, we need to really think about this um, in, in a different way. Uh, Atandiwe, I'll give it to Atandiwe now because you'll push also for this collaborative thing. And I need, we need more money coming actually in terms of R&D in this space, especially from the private sector. Definitely, definitely. And I think I just want to reiterate the part of collaboration and the importance of collaboration. Can you imagine as an investigative journalist being able to work with an AI expert, a data expert, a, te a data technologist, and the kind of journalism that we will be able to create and put out there? holding those uh, 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 in power accountable. There's so, much, so many different projects that Bugosi and I have already worked on. I'm a journalist, he's a data expert in a university, but through that collaboration, it means that we're able here today to stand here and actually explain the broader world of AI and see how, w what kind of stories that we can put out there. Can you imagine trying to find, uh, what was one of our projects the, the, on, on the court records where we were trying to figure out how, what biases there might be in court records. As a journalist, I would never be able to do that by myself. But working with the team, the data team, the data experts, the AI experts, they are able to work with me and structure a lot of this data to answer such important questions that we have uh, and society has as well. We have maybe five minutes uh, for questions. Um, uh, <laughs> five to ten minutes of questions. I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, Fifteen minutes. Awesome. We have 15 minutes of questions. Let's open it up. Yeah. One thing. Um, so unfortunately, I, 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 I have been okay with calling myself that now I'm an AI politician. So I have to, after this, I'll be here until half past 10, but I have to rush to Pretoria to sort out something with government. Uh, but Kathleen, who, if you can raise your hand, is here from our lab at the university and also Masakane. Uh, so if you need to talk, she's here for the day. Uh, she's right sitting there um, in the middle. Uh, for us, like thanks to all the people we work with <laughs> in different spaces and, and collaborate. And yeah, if there's, I'll just leave this here as the Q&A comes along. Uh, at the bottom there, you can still sign up for Vula Vula, which is the two from Lelapa. And if you need to get in contact, that's all. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I, I'm Guy Berger. Um, I, I think what I also picked up in your presentation, uh, Bukosi, is that this is not just a technical question. Because, for example, you couldn't get the data out of government. When you came to looking at, you showed us the screen of data on Setswana, Facebook is blank. These are policy questions. Unless journalists are aware of these policy questions and can push them to have open data, we, we're going to be handicapped. The second thing is, I think we need to be quite cautious about thinking that these are just tools that we just use, because these are two-sided swords. And so we have learned in the past years, when we search Google, Google is searching us, that when we are talking to face our friends on Facebook, actually we are talking to a machine learning system with algorithms that keeps us engaged and then skews the content accordingly. So we have to think with these tools, who controls them? Uh, who's benefiting from them? At the end of the day, will, are we producing data by using these tools that will lead to AI apps being the source, the destination for people to get their news? <laughs> Whereas we think we are just doing it. So it's not just a question of individual journalists using tools. Uh, these tools are using us as well. And we have to think what's the longer term consequences. And therefore, I really request uh, investigative journalists keep an eye on this big picture as well, because it's a, it's, a, it's a data policy question, it's a governance question, it's about the geopolitics. Can you imagine that you're using these tools and they end up being controlled not by Sam Altman, by Elon Musk? Uh, I mean, in, <laughs> how much worse can that be? So please don't only think of a instrumentalist. We have to make sure we are not instrumentalized only by these tools. Thank you. 
Definitely, definitely. I definitely agree with that. Uh, the mic, where was the next question? Just as I address uh, the, the comment as well. And I think uh, halfway through the presentation, I'd mentioned that we need to think about what we need as, as newsrooms, as a society. What do we need? And how do we, and I think what Vogos what is talking about as well, what kind of AI society do we create around us so that these tools are not necessarily just using us? Because we all understand how the data works and algorithms work, uh, I hope we all understand, how algorithms work and how data works. But it's about us, what do we need, instead of constantly falling into the trap of somebody else building tools, and then we say, yes, we're going to use that one, we're going to use that one, we're going to use that one. And as investigative journalists, I think we, we need to think much broadly about and, and also report on how these tools are being built. What are these tools doing in terms of privacy as well? Because governments are also going to be using a lot of these tools to monitor, to track, to listen, all of that kind of stuff. We need to be reporting about it as well and seeing the kind of, of society that we want to build and use these tools within. Yeah. Uh, a quick one, just to give uh, some heuristics. Uh, likely, like I do, I do know, we've interacted, and Kathleen can tell you more about even some of the things we've been trying to do in Kenya with newsrooms, uh, with media houses on availing, especially local language data. Uh, for us, there's a bit of, yes, fair use uh, parts that come in, but we would like to get into conversations where we have permissive licenses. Yes, you can block specific types of actors, but for a lot of researchers in African languages, having permissive licenses that allow us to keep on doing this research, creating tools, we release our models open source at the university. So you can use that model, you can download it, use it yourself without us being on there. And the reason is for people to be able to give feedback, to also adjust them, to use them in the way they are. And it's not only just building these large models that are behind black boxes that you can't really interact with. And, and there's a whole movement kind of um, that goes with that. Uh, so opening it up, public broadcasting, permissive licenses, uh, um, please, let's have a chat about that. But anyway, I think there was a question around here. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. My question was basically, uh, what, what are specific considerations that should be taken into account when developing and deploying AI generative um, systems? Oh, sure. I think one just quickly highlighted was that part of the, this, this alignment thing. Who are you aligning it to becomes an issue. And there's also use cases of uh, I, I think as Guy said, like people will be using these for different things and they are also monitoring you. What happens when you're using some of these systems that are closed where they're actually tracking you uh, becomes a question. One of the big challenges that we had in the middle of the year is the whole thing of just imagine, especially in, in a lot of our people's work in this room, you're sitting there, you're looking with confidential information and you're trying to access things and you put information inside. What stops that company from saying, I quickly identify if somebody is putting in information that's novel, that is connected to a state that pays us to monitor for this input and then report to them what it is that somebody is doing, right? So there's a lot of these things that come in and, and that's why you have to have laws um, in some ways and policy that says that this is very clear that it's happening, that you must declare that these types of things are, at the moment we don't, you, you just, you know, you log in, you put in things, they say we don't track you, but you don't really know, right, if that's, if that's the truth. Um, I think that was a question, sorry. Yeah. yeah, thank you, and thanks a lot, um, a Vukosi yeah. and, and Atandisha for your, for your presentation. Um, uh, I just, I'm interested in asking you, Vukosi, um, will the pace of change of, of AI outstrip um, um, our ability to adapt as a people? And so, so, so I'm asking whether will AI be conscious of itself at some point with <laughs> all this chat GPT 4 and maybe 4.5? What will happen to chat GPT 7? And um, just to reiterate, Guy, I, I am really worried. Um, I, I, in your slides, I didn't get enough reassurance that um, <laughs> we are having indigenous, um, sharing indigenous knowledge in terms of avoiding or resisting data imperialism. We have Google and Elon Musk being the one who are dominating um, the space and the, the data dumping that you are getting from, from them as well. So I just thought maybe you should really reassure us ab about whether, um, <laughs> we, <laughs> whether we have a future as having our own indigenous African data that is reflective of not repeating what has been happening with colonialism. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a bit of a, 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 I think a self promotion. So I'm, I'm, I am giving a TEDx talk. Uh, on the 4th of December 
on that angle. Uh, on, it's just that for this, we had to, you always have to choose what the angle of the talk is going to be, so we went through that. Uh, but yeah, uh, please support, at the end of that TED talk, just to bury the, like, you know, not to bury the lead, just to say it out there, it says support the doers. Support the doers, there's many organizations on the African continent who are working to make sure we count when it comes to this. Uh, sure, the war that's raging on, it's very funny, there's a whole war that's raging on in some rooms currently at the moment. I know I'm gonna go back onto X in a couple of minutes, and then I'm gonna start seeing, again, the changes that are happening between Microsoft and OpenAI, and likely are going to reverberate on there. And it's just a weird thing. Why did we give power to one company? <laughs> <laughs> right to literally make the few to, to make this decision about the future collectively about where AI is going and it's a very odd thing and and this is one of the things where for example in the deep learning in Daba when we started it in 2017 and it actually started in in, 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 in I think the auditorium next door the first meeting on strengthening African AI was on this that this is coming this was back in 2016 you were telling me like this is coming and we don't believe that on the African continent there's no government and private sector who actually understand the magnitude that this is going to have on Africans and we need to change the way that we do things. And now it's here and it's almost like the, cut, the cake has already been sliced and cut. We're just trying to go in and say, please recognize that we are also people. <laughs> Right, and, and this is the part that now we're going through. So, so support the organizations that are doing that, find ways to collaborate, and then build on these things. Because if we don't, we're not gonna have any agency. All it is is just going to be that screen that has a prompt at the bottom. And that's the only thing you are allowed to do is just put stuff in, ask, they harvest your information anyway, <laughs> and never give anything, anything back to you. So yeah. Okay. yeah okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, Pierre. Lots of very important questions, lots of important discussion that has to take place around this. So please engage with them and at other AI sessions because these issues are absolutely um, important. And we could have one announcement before we move on. I sent a notice last night prematurely about a gaming thing that we're doing, we're doing it this evening. So um, Africa Uncensored. Uh, have been gaming some of their stories to reach different audiences and they've set up a, a quick ice-breaking game that we'll do this evening. Please download um, the app. Um, I put it in last night with a link. <laughs> Thank you, Guy. Um, um, okay, well, if you want to participate, please download the app. Um, um, yeah. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and we'll see you this evening. Thank you.